Hello, everyone. Uh, we are joined to, uh, today by our uh, esteemed guest, uh, uh, Professor uh, Alejandro Bernstein, Alex Bernstein. Um, uh, Dr. Bernstein, uh, he, he's originally from Mexico and uh, he uh, completed his medical school training in, in, in the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico and then uh, came to the U.S. where he uh, uh, completed a residency in uh, radiology at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Um, then uh, uh, that was under Harold Meadey and uh, uh, Jun Peng Wang. And then he went to NYU where he completed a fellowship in neuroradiology. Um, after completing the fellowship in neuroradiology, his major interest was in interventional neuroradiology, which was a field that didn't exist at the time when he trained. And he was the creator of the first program of interventional neuroradiology in the country, in the United States. He, uh, at that moment, he was one of the first to, to take this uh, specialty seriously from around the world and, and, and came up with new ideas of developing catheters, developing balloons, uh, uh, being a contributor to creating a company, the first company dedicated to uh, neurointerventional uh, surgery or interventional radiology or neuroendovascular surgery, how many people call it today. Um, yeah, Dr. Bernstein has been uh, uh, practicing for the past, uh, how many years now? Uh, Do we have to take it? <laughs> Do we need to count? <laughs> well, we're 40, 44th year. Okay, so 44 years, and uh, in the, he has been uh, internationally recognized as, uh, if not the, at least one of the fathers of the field uh, with his creativity, uh, innovation, determination, uh, push a field that was originally under the realm of radiology and uh, made it a, 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 a a field that uh, many people want to take a credit for. Now, uh, the neurology specialty, the neurosurgery specialty, uh, uh, have uh, uh, many, many, many practitioners from around the world that are elevating the, the craft. And I am uh, very fortunate uh, to have been uh, uh, trained uh, by uh, Professor Bernstein and, uh, and then uh, spend uh, several more years as, uh, as one of his partners. Uh, and, and during that time, for me, it was uh, not just learning about medicine, but learning about life uh, from a mentor as Dr. Bernstein. So, uh, Dr. Bernstein, welcome uh, to the conversation. And uh, you, we have uh, uh, um, some cases that we can show if we need to discuss. However, we have a chat option in which uh, the, the audience can ask us questions. And if they ask us questions, we will address those. I mean, it would make it more, more interesting. Um, uh, to start, obviously, after that introduction, it would be very interesting to hear uh, uh, your beginnings of how uh, you went into the field and how uh, you thought that this was a, a good idea, which at the moment, many people would have thought that you were crazy. And, and, and now uh, it has paid dividends uh, tremendously. Uh, so we would like to hear from you. That's uh, an interesting story. Uh... You can't put it into the thing into one thing. There were a set of circumstances uh, that created uh, the opportunity. Uh, first, uh, uh, I uh, uh, trained, as you said, uh, in Mexico City uh, at the UNAM. And uh, in Mexico, uh, you uh, pay very little for school. In those days, it was $16 or the equivalent, uh, and you received a fantastic education. Uh, the idea was then that at the end of your uh, formation, uh, you would do an internship before you graduate, so you get a clinical experience, and then you would work for one year for the government. It's called social service, which I believe would be fantastic for this country, where you take uh, doctors to pay back for the education, and they get assigned to areas where there's no physicians, rural areas, uh, things like that. Uh, so I actually uh, was in a rural area where there was a uh, tremendous lack of water. Uh, there was a difficulty with uh, uh, 
growing, uh, you know, growing uh, uh, things out of the earth. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, I was able to get a, uh, a rotating internship in Israel, which was exciting. I was living, you know, to your, that age, you want to go as far as you can. Uh, <laughs> so I went uh, to Israel and I saw something that was very unique. Uh, they had desert on the right side. And on the left side, you would see orange trees growing. How do they do it? They had no water. It was worse than what we had in Mexico. Uh, it was desert. So they had a thing called the drop by drop irrigation. That means they had little tubes, uh, little hoses, they were very fundamental, with little drops. And instead of flooding the land so that the fluid would get in, the water would get into the roots, uh, it was actually drop by drop ir irrigation. So you needed much less water, okay? Uh, number three, uh, you know, I uh, went for a uh, uh, internship and I saw for the first time, uh, you know, a radiologist doing an angiogram. And I wanted to be a surgeon, right? Who wants to be a radiologist? Uh, but it turned out there was a very interesting thing. And I saw this guy pushing little catheters. Uh, so that brought the idea uh, that maybe we could do medication. We can inject medicines or something with that catheter. And then I had a little a patient, a soldier actually, a kid that was uh, actually about my age, a little younger, had a kidney infection uh, sensitive to, uh, uh, it was a pseudomona, sensitive to coranfenicol. And we gave him the coranfenicol and the kid died on me from a plastic anemia, a very rare, the very lethal uh, side effects of, uh, of the medication. So then putting things together, uh, when I saw this, guy doing angiograms, bingo, he was putting a catheter right in the renal artery. I said, hey, if I put a catheter in the renal artery and I put a catheter in the renal vein, I can give the medicine in the artery and take it out in the vein. It will never become systemic. So I go back, to, besides, there was another part to the story. Uh, my wife said to me, which is, we're just married, that uh, if, I, uh, if I become a surgeon, that she's leaving. She's going back to Canada because she'll never see me. So I said, this works perfectly. I came to Josie and I said, Jose, I'm going to be a radiologist. And she looks at me and says, there's something suspicious here. There's something not right here. I said, no, no, seriously. You know, I told her the truth that because, you know, this thing with catheters and made sense and all that. Uh, turns out that I work uh, harder with what I was doing than, he, than anything. But anyway, so all those things together, I started. At that time, there were very few places that were doing anything because it didn't exist. But there was one place in New York at NYU uh, where there was Dr. Ransohoff that was using little silicone bills that would cut down in the neck, put a, a Foley catheter, a urinary catheter in the carotid. So I said, oh, I'm getting, it's getting more interesting, all this thing. So we, put, we used to put the, the, the surgeon would do the cut down. We would put the little Kifa catheter and then we put, you know, one little ball at a time to go up to close an AVM. And that's how I started. And uh, at that time, as you said, there was nothing uh, going into a company saying you want to develop something for neuro application. They said, oh, no, no, that's too risky, too risky. So we actually had to learn to do it ourselves. So we would buy, you know, uh, tubing from Dow Corning and start on learning how to make catheters by hand, you know, we used to smoke all at that time. So you had your cigarette and you had the lighter and with the lighter you would uh, flare the catheter or cut the catheter, things like that. So that's how it started in, uh, this is a long time ago, 19, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and what's your, 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 how do you feel now, uh, 40 years later after seeing the tremendous growth of the field? And you're talking about uh, making catheters and now every day someone comes with a new device that is better than the previous one. Uh, like for example, right now we just put a flow diverter that is better than the one that was made two years ago. And, and, and we're treating now patients with stents uh, in the arteries to treat an aneurysm without having to do an open head surgery, without having to get into the aneurysm with the risk of rupturing the aneurysm. And the patients are going home the next day and walking and talking and back to normal. What, how do you feel about this transformation? How do I feel? Fantastic. <laughs> It's, a, it's great, it's created a new specialty in medicine. Remember, we were doing this before cardiology uh, started learning about catheters. 
uh, you know, there was nothing in cardiology at the time. It was cardiac angiography or crudely. Uh, so I remember having uh, Grunzek uh, visit me. You know, Grunzek was the man who invented the balloons for balloon angioplasty coronaries. Uh, and, uh, you know, he came to see me how I was doing embolizations of the brain. Uh, and at that time, we had, we had balloons, but for re different reasons. We started using balloons that, that we used in the biliary system to do balloon test occlusion, for example. Uh, we were trying to stop the flow of blood. No, it's created an incredible uh, specialty in the world of medicine. I would say that uh, this is the most exciting. It's fantastic. We have learned to navigate through the highways. The, 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 the vascular system, the arterial system, imagine, is, is, is the roads. You know, we go, we're learning how to go from one place to the other. And guess what? We're now getting into the sewer system. We're going into the veins, which actually are even more fascinating because the tissues don't eat in the arteries. Besides, if you go through the arteries, uh, you can produce ischemic problems uh, as you're injecting something to get, let's say, to a malformation. Uh, whereas if you come from the veins, you're at the end organ. The interaction of, of, of all the, the uh, substances that are absorbed and, and, and clear and all that is at the venular level. So we're starting to to learn to go through the sewer system and manipulate. I predict that, for example, the work you're doing with brain tumors, that you're going through an arterial catheter, we're gonna be doing it the other way around. We're gonna come transvenous, stop the flow of blood in the arterial side and flood the system for three minutes, for two minutes. And you're gonna be able to diffuse by a permeable membrane principle, you're gonna be able to diffuse the medicine into the tissues without taking the risk of a stroke. So this is just, uh, we're gonna see this is expansion, robotics. Robotics are coming our way. Yeah. Hey, this is, if I would be, your, your age here, Rafa, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but if I would be a medical student, go finish. I think that this is, this is one of the most fascinating things in medicine. Yeah, and, and uh, we have obviously uh, uh, Jason here, who's an open uh, cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. And uh, the, the question always comes, uh, is he gonna be able to eat? Uh, uh, he, can, he, can take, he can take a fellowship, uh, you know, before I retire maybe. <laughs> no, no, but, but in reality, is there gonna be a role for oh, the yeah. open oh, yeah. neurosurgeon? I, I am convinced, of course, of course. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, uh, open neurosurgery will go into more uh, maybe tissue transplant, but even that we're gonna do it with the catheters. You know, look, subdural hematoma. Who, is, who expected subdural hematoma is a thing? Actually, neurosurgeons don't like to do it. That's the reason why they're letting us do it. But the subdural hematomas, we are now able to treat many of them uh, by embolizing the meninges. Uh, I think that what's happening uh, is actually uh, what will happen. And that is that uh, many of the cerebrovascular surgeons of today uh, are ambidextrous. That means uh, they learn how to do open nerve surgery and closed nerve surgery. But if you even look at the trends of all the, this generation of leadership in our field, uh, the endovascular aspect is quite important. If you're gonna do brain tumors, for example, uh, probably for a while, uh, the nerve surgery, open nerve surgery will still be there. Uh, if you tell me 10, 15 years from now, are we gonna do open nerve surgery? Yes, to the bulk large tumors. But to really treat cerebral cancer, I, I think we're going to do endovascular. Jason, what do you think? Um, well, I think what you say is interesting. To, to have both skills certainly makes you uh, versatile. But then that brings up the question, how best to go about training? Um, as you know, at this point, um, you can go into the neuroendovascular world from many different routes. Do you feel there ought to be a singular route, a more um, kind of uh, like a residency in this sort of thing? Or do you feel like uh, it's, it's good for the field that you're able to uh, take in people from various specialties and and it brings in different perspectives. What do you think about that? It's an it's a excellent question. Uh, we've been debating this now for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. 
Uh, if you give me the ideal, I'll give you an ideal, but then come the political reality. Uh, I happen to be the first person that uh, trained a neurosurgeon and trained a neurologist. I was uh, excommulgated, or whatever they say in English, from, from the radiology world. I was told that treason. But that was not the point, because the important was not who you come from or where you come from, is where you're going. And I thought that if we have the input of the radiologists with the ability to uh, relate to a fluoroscope, to relate uh, to an imaging in 2D, uh, mostly in those days, uh, if you had a neurosurgeon that had um, an access to, a, to, to more um, um, another perspective of coming, and then having a neurologist who did a lot of mental exercise uh, about it, that means, you know, more intellectual. I thought that if we bring them all together, we will get improvement to the specialty. Although at the beginning, those things go down a little bit because people coming from different places have different skills. And it takes different amount of time to, <clears throat> to learn those skills, to master those skills. It's reality of today. If you ask me how I would like to do it, I'd like to take somebody out of medical school, even when they're going to medical school, and use medical school as general culture. That means uh, for me to be uh, whatever, I have to go to high school, I have to go, I have to learn how to read, I have to learn how to write, correct? I have to learn certain things to be able to do uh, a better, more sophisticated thing. The body of knowledge of medicine today is so vast that taking somebody out of medical school and making him an endovascular surgeon to do what we do, uh, I would take him and give him basic science, neuroscience, for example, uh, basic uh, ICU skills, uh, basic vascular system, because you're navigating to the vascular system. You need to understand endothelium. I mean, I didn't study endothelium. Did you study anybody? Did anybody study endothelium? And we're poking around with endothelium every day, putting a cathode back and forth, a guide wire. So I would, I would make the curriculum uh, geared for this specialty, it will take five years. You will spend two years, for example, in, in pathology of vascular system. Uh, you would spend ICU, and you go cardiac ICU, peripheral, I mean, the medical ICU, and neurosurgical ICU. So that at the end of, now also the other problem is how long do you train somebody? You can't, you know, guy, you know, we did 14 years of training. Those things, who's paying for that? Uh, reality and the future is going to be hard. So I would take for six years. And at the end of those six years, or five and a half, six years, you will be a GP endovascular. You can do cardiology, you can do peripheral, and you can do neuro. And then you do a fellowship, I want to do organ-oriented. I had a whole presentation, uh, one of the uh, multiple papers got rejected, in which how do you build somebody, how do you... I was, uh, you know, asked by the American Academy of Science, uh, and it was published. Uh, but I, that's how what we did. In six years, we made a somebody... Uh, that was much better prepared than I was prepared, or Rafa was prepared, uh, or Yafel was prepared. Uh, so that's what I would think I would do. I see. Now, the way our department is set up, it's set up that we, we have the individuals with a specific skill set. So, you know, Dr. Langer and I do open surgery, and Rafa and Yafel do endovascular surgery, and we communicate constantly and, you know, we conference and every vascular patient we think about together. Um, the current trend in departments is to have one person doing everything. Do you think that's, um, that creates the same culture as um, the setup that we sort of have here? I, I happen to, to come from the same background as you just described. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, when I came to this, you know, doing this thing, there was no possibility for me to do neurosurgery. There was no possibility for a neurosurgeon to do endovascular. So we do have that model. As a matter of fact, I work with uh, uh, David and with Rafa in that model. But you ask me how, if I get somebody out of medical school, I think you waste a lot of time in your neurosurgery doing movement disorders. Uh, I did a lot of barium enemas. Do I need to know how to do barium enemas to do this? Give me a break, no? I mean, <laughs> That's it. I hated that type of thing, but I had to do barium animals. Uh, so I do think there's a lot of waste in medical studies. Uh, you did, what, seven years of neurosurgery? That's right. If you're doing vascular, if vascular is your field, 
-hmm. Do you need to do spine? Do you need to do peripheral nerve? Right. It's a waste of time. So, so I think that society uh, will impose on us uh, to, to shorten the wasted time and focus on, and also the body of knowledge. You know, when I, when I was uh, uh, studying the pediatric, for example, pediatric neurosurgery was just beginning. And the, the system, the, the, the boards, uh, the societies of neurosurgery were very worried. They said, what happens if I'm a general neurosurgeon in Wichita, Kansas, I don't have enough, uh, adults, no, enough pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, so the guy who did adults also did children. Uh, and then this individual uh, is doing children and something happens. And then somebody says, well, are you a pediatric neurosurgeon? I was no, but, but, but this, he couldn't be a pediatric Where he was, there was not enough material. If you have not enough material to do, let's say only vascular neurosurgery, then you need to survive. Uh, so I do think that, that society will, will hopefully uh, force us to, 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 to really become more, more focused on what we're doing because also the body of knowledge, as I said, is increasing to really know everything is going in vascular. You're gonna need to, to it's, it's more, it's a, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Yeah. It, it, I understand, I understand. And uh, Dr. Bernstein, um, uh, for the people that don't know, Dr. Bernstein uh, is the um, co-author of the Bible of uh, neuro, neuro, vascular and neuroanatomy, functional vascular neuroanatomy, and um, and he has won many, many, many awards all over the world. Has trained many fellows um, of all of these accomplishments. What are you the most proud of? <laughs> well, it's actually the people I train. I would say that uh, that that is a tremendous satisfaction. Uh, see, you know, that many of them have done extremely well, are leaders in the field. And uh, that's the only thing that you're really going to have. You know, people ask me, well, what's your legacy? And I'm, my legacy, I mean, I'm going to be gone. Who cares? But uh, the reality is that, you know, uh, the people that I train, uh, the books, I mean, the beauty of life is that in a career is the, is the variety. And I've been extremely lucky. Uh, I mean, there's some of the uh, devices that I've done. I mean, the Bernstein catheter is still one of the most frequently used things. Uh, I was stupid enough that I didn't know that I could get royalties for it. So NYU is the one who did really well there. Uh, but, you know, then you learn, you know, you, you live and you learn. Um, I have a new catheter coming out that, that does bending and does turning. So this guy, I'm super excited about that. Uh, and the beauty of life is that uh, you what, can't... Is, what is that called? The, the flexible version? No, it's called the bend it. <laughs> <Okay>. Bend it. <laughs> okay. Because it bends. And we, we're getting, we get, putting it into robotics now. So, you know, uh, I mean, uh, as, long as, uh, as long as this one works, we keep on going. But, so but, that, no, but I'm very lucky. And to that point... Uh, one of the major things that we're focusing uh, with a group of students that are spending the summer with us is talking about leadership and talking about teamwork uh, uh, and how important it is to have uh, people that complement each other and how important it is to, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to, to, to demonstrate uh, the, you, whatever you have learned in the past from your mentors and so that you can practice and reflect that leadership to your, to your patients and others. Any advice on leadership to a student listening today? I would say honesty. Honesty is probably the best thing to be a good leader. Uh, without getting political, look what's going on in our country. So, you know, I would say that uh, honesty, uh, we, we physicians are a little bit different. Uh, you, at least I, uh, and I know you too, Rafa, because I know you well, uh, have a lot of pleasure when we fix somebody, when we make the right diagnosis, uh, when we see a patient that, that was with a horrible stroke and then suddenly stands up and walks and all that, which is, which is something that uh, uh, in, let's say, business, you, you, you get happy if you made a good deal. Uh, so I think that leadership <clears throat> starts with honesty. Uh, leadership starts with recognizing that, that everybody in the team is as important as you. 
uh, I cannot do what, as a matter of fact, as you know, uh, when you have a nurse that helps you, a good nurse, it makes you a better doctor. You have a good physician assistant, it makes you a better doctor. Uh, and if you recognize the value that people that work with you have, that's what a good leader is because you recognize what those people bring to the table. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned that you said that without getting into detail about the, the issues with the within, within the in the country right now, but uh, I have to bring up a topic. Uh, you're a great thinker and analyzer, and given what's happening with COVID and the response in the U.S. particularly, what should we, do you think we should be expecting in the upcoming months and years uh, with the pandemic and how we're getting affected by it? Oh, I think we're in serious, serious trouble. I think that uh, uh, if you compare uh, the United States, which are multiple states with their own little government, let's call it, uh, from governors to uh, mayors to whatever, and then you take the European Union, which are actually different countries with truly different governments, and how they have taken their approach to this problem uh, of, uh, of closing uh, taking very strong measures. Look at Italy, look at Spain. They were terrible, remember? Italy was going then. then and, and today, you look at what's going on at the EU, European Union, and there is already flights between all the countries. Look what's happening here. Uh, my buddy from California cannot come in because he comes in, he's going to start on the whole thing again. Yeah. You know, the state of New York has done very, very well. It has had leadership. Uh, yeah. But the rest of the country is incredible. I mean, to have the leadership saying that the most, this is a saliva disease. So put something in your mouth. I mean, you know, put it, you don't have to be even a president to, to, to think that, you know, you just have to, to what's, going, what's happening between the, 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 the fact that, that it brings out all our weaknesses. That means the people that are having more uh, uh, effects from this pandemic is the people that are more oppressed, that are uh, less lucky than those people who, have more, you know. So I think that uh, I'm very concerned. I think we're not going to go out of this one for a while. I think that uh, New York, if we're lucky enough to to, to prevent a rebound, uh, it's going to be a, a miracle. Until they don't say today, in Arizona, in California, in Texas, you close it, man. You stay home, you know, for 14 days, two weeks, four weeks, whatever the cycle is, this is going to spread. Uh, Yafel, you have been very quiet today, and I want to ask you a question because um, you, uh, I, I, we want to hear, we haven't heard it in this forum, how you end up being who you are today, meaning you are an interventional neuroradiologist, uh, so you ended up following uh, Dr. Bernstein's steps, uh, but what happened in your life that ended up where you are? It's actually funny because it's somewhat a little similar to what Dr. Bernstein described. It's always about the why in the end. Um, it was about probably a couple of months until I had to apply for residency. And, you know, at the time, I was always interested in the brain. So it was, you know, either neurology or neurosurgery. And I had kind of like ruled out neurology because it was too much you know, um, too much rounding on patients and kind of like not doing anything. That was my perspective back then, obviously. Then I was set up on neurosurgery, except for my wife was like, you know, hey, you know, if you do neurosurgery, this marriage is not going to last. And then I, I was taking the shuttle bus at NYU and I bumped into my dean and he told, and we were talking and he said, hey, you should go and check out what Kim Nelson is doing in their intervention on, and you know, at the time neuroradiology had become very popular at NYU because it was about the time when Bob Grossman had become the dean in the hospital. So, so then I went to the Angel Suite, I saw what those guys were doing there and, and kind of like, and that's how I made up my mind. I saw what they were doing, I was very impressed. So that's how I kind of ended up in, in their intervention in the end. So funny how indirectly Dr. Bernstein had everything to do for you to train. Absolutely. And, and talking about, <laughs> you know, talking about the field, you know, um, I think very few people in the world right now could, could have as much insight of the field as, as you, Dr. Bernstein, given that 
you pretty much started the field in our in here in the U.S. I wanted to hear from you what your thoughts are. I think 2015 marked a very important year for neurointervention because all the stroke trials came out. And I think it made the field somewhat mainstream. When I say mainstream, meaning a ton of community hospitals wanted to just build a biplane. Everyone and their mother wanted to start a biplane, um, you know, not, not only in big cities, but everywhere in the country. And I wanted to know first, what are your thoughts on that? on all these smaller hospitals trying to build biplane to take care of a stroke patients. And then the next logical question, which is who should be doing a stroke aside from people formally training during intervention? There's a lot of talk right now about, you know, we not being enough to provide cold coverage for a stroke in the country. And then having cardiologists come in the field or body interventional radiologists come in the field and so on. What are your thoughts on those two things? First of all, making neurointerventional quote unquote mainstream and second of all, having other specialties come and do a stroke procedures. Well, you know, you can't stop progress and advancement. I'll give you a little bit of story. Uh, in the uh, in about 1988, 89, uh, we started doing stroke. Uh, we started doing stroke, but it was very different. We would take a catheter, put it in a carotid artery, uh, put a little bit in that time. There were streptokinase. Uh, and yes, some did open, but there were some hemorrhages. So, you know, it stopped. Then came urokinase. Uh, and uh, urokinase, we actually, now at that time, we had uh, the beginning of the magic catheters, which is a, a flow guided catheter. You actually let it go up. It, it went up even if you don't know how to do it. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so um, you know, facilitated and it started that, but we didn't have all the things that exist today. So going to your question, uh, it was. It has been a long time. Carotid stenting was the first one that really was was faced with that. And as you know, cardiologists are doing a tremendous amount of carotid stenting, probably more than neuro people. Uh, and then came vascular surgeons. Uh, what Rafa said is, when I started, everybody thought that we were crazy. But I say we must have done something good that everybody wants to do it now. We have uh, neurology, neurosurgeons, radiologists, cardiologists, vascular surgeons. They all want to do this. So something is going right. So stroke is so much more frequent than AVMs or aneurysm that obviously was a tremendous impact in healthcare and in society. Uh, you're familiar now with robotics, the Corinthian system. Uh, there is an effort uh, to be able to do uh, procedures at a distance, uh, mostly procedures that are life-saving like that. Uh, but I feel that the future of stroke to really make the next impact, it has to be done in the ambulance. It has to be done either that or we find a way how to freeze everybody until they come into a specialized center. Uh, so we need neuroprotectives that will, will expand the time or the window in which we can treat these people, save brain, which will happen because many things are going to happen parallel or simultaneously. Uh, but I don't think that uh, cardiologists that we were afraid will take over ischemic stroke that fast. Hi, David. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think that cardiologists have been able to, and you know why? You know why cardiologists have not, they're in every hospital. They're doing acute heart, you know, heart attacks and things. It's because they're having a hell of a problem with the aortic arch. So <laughs> the cardiologists have actually gotten, I hate to tell you, but this catheter that we're developing it makes it so easy to come from the brachial to the brain. You know, it's, it's just because you, you don't even need a guide wire, actually. Uh, that's how, so I think that that is gonna make uh, a change. I do think that uh, there will be emergency procedures done by people that are not as trained as, as well as you're trained or as well trained uh, as we would have liked them to, uh, but, but it's going to happen. On one way, you know, one day or another. Uh, now, ideally, it would be that you can make procedures that are what I call doctor's proof. You know, if they, any doctor can do it, it becomes safe. If it's going to be only certain people that can do it, it's not yet a good procedure. Hey, Alex, can I ask you a question? If I say no, what happened? No, no, yes, of course. <laughs> so I wish I was here at the beginning. I'm sorry, I got I have a resin case. I had to had to stick for a half hour. Did you ever, 
when I remember when we were in you, when I first started doing bypass with you and trying to make it, you know, learning this, some of the technology, the Yolana stuff, it, be, it potentially could have made it easier. Mm -hmm. And I remember some of the guys I was talking to, there were guys in the field who were concerned if we made it easy, that more people would do it. And the problem with that isn't that you, it wasn't so much the technical part, but it's the thinking and the, and the management of the other problems that weren't necessarily easy or hard, but required experience and thought. And, and it wasn't just all, you know, fun and games. I it, it, never anticipate that the, my view is that stroke is as great as stroke and as the device have gotten better, that it's done an enormous amount of damage to the field, that it's made what used to be not harder, but less, you know, it's, it's created a lower threshold to try to do things. And then with stroke itself, because it's almost like tails wagging the dog, you have all these people who can do strokes, but aren't really trained. You know, if you, it, I mean, I'm sure when you told me not that you didn't think I could do this, which well, in some ways you were right. Now compared to the, you know, the, the average interventionist, I'm a genius. <laughs> I mean, you know, but the truth is, could you have ever anticipated that this would have gone this way? I mean, what's, what's the overall, I mean, how do, what's your, you know, you know what it takes to do your job well. I, I'm, I'm much more sensitive now than I've ever been to the amount of time and effort and thinking it takes to do the types of things that you did for many years and continue to do and that you trained Rafa. I, don't, I mean, I haven't worked as much with Yafel, but he trained with Kim, comes from that same school. And yet we're just seeing an explosion of people with catheters. Mm -hmm. Is this a, how do you react to that? And knowing where you've been in your field, what's your overall reaction? How do I react? Uh, I have not lost that much hair, but it's, I'm losing some. Uh, I, would, I would separate the excellent question and I don't think I have an absolute answer. But I think that uh, ischemic stroke uh, is a true healthcare issue that affects such a huge amount of population uh, that, uh, that, that is has changed the bar. I think that the real danger, as you mentioned, is somebody who thinks they can do ischemic stroke uh, and then thinks they can do an aneurysm. And they're very different. The skills to treat an aneurysm endovascular are very different than the skills to try to retrieve a clot with a suction catheter. You know, you push, 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 you suck, and, you know, and then you don't even know if you hurt the patient or it didn't work. You know, in, in, in ischemic stroke, uh, people don't speak about complications. Speak, did it work or didn't work, which has nothing to... So that, that is something that unfortunately is very difficult to uh, regulate. Uh, but I, I mean, think that's... Like, it's kind of like saying, you know, I'm a really good subdural surgeon. I'm going to now put exactly. aneurysms. Well, I actually heard an interventionist that remain nameless say at a meeting, you know, and I'm really good at stroke, but it's all the other stuff that I have trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about that. Think about, and that statement's actually an acceptable statement. It's like, what? He probably so, the guy is the guy is 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 honest, but he's stupid. You know. <laughs> so that's a, the truth. This that's the biggest the biggest the biggest problem we're living now is exactly that is that, uh, listen, I went when I was uh, reviewing uh, programs, you know, and certified programs, uh, I asked, I went to a, a, a program, again, no names would be said, uh, but uh, I asked for the log, you know, of the fellows to show me what they've done. And I see, and it says uh, 42 vessels. I say, hey, what does that mean? Uh, you know, what is 42 vessels? So he says to me, he says, Dr. Benson, as you know, the left carotid is much more difficult to catheterize than the other ones. So there's three of us. So in every patient, we rotate. I says, I mean, explain me more. He says, yeah, one day I do all the right carotids. My partner does the left carotids <laughs> and the other one does the vertebral. So the guy was trained with 42 vessels. He didn't do patient. He did 42 catheterization. So I went to the program director. I says, hey, man, I can't certify this program. So the guy says to me, well, what's wrong with you? I said, what do you mean, what's wrong with me? He says, what do you want me to do? I have to be on call. I need to train these guys. I said, you train these guys to what? To cure or to kill? 
okay? And I decided that I, I was not politically correct to review programs. But that's, that's, that's a problem that the societies, that the, that the body of teaching has to get involved. We have to have a minimum standards uh, to be able to, to keep and advance the field. And we have a responsibility to the patients and to the trainees. But the trouble but is there are opposite, there's opposite needs. You need more stroke doctors and more locations yeah. to, to treat that disease. And by definition, that, that, that basically decreased the volume the of rat disease. And it's, it's a diabolical problem. If you had to design, I mean, I remember talking to Jacques in, in France, they have a major hub and spoke system in Paris. So, you know, they don't run this problem in, in, in some European countries. If you could design- but they're, they're not, David, they're not fee for service. I know. Okay, I so you. let's call it by, by its name. Uh, when there's fee for service in a system like us, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a serious problem. So uh, medicine has to change drastically in its education, in its reimbursement, uh, in, in, in that's something that's that- the other problem, because stroke doesn't reimburse the doctor, it reimburses the hospital. You know, so you have fees for coverage. And then so you're, but you get, the only way you can make more money is not doing more strokes, it's doing everything else. And right. so that is another, an added, you know, incentive to do the other things because negative incentive. It's just it, it's just probably the most poorly designed. You know, you know, it's the metrics and the shiny objects have, and it's just it's just decimating our field. I, I, it really is. I mean, uh, I yeah, 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 yeah. incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, would like, you how would you redesign I, it if you could? What would you do? I'm gonna is Rafa. How are you? No, 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 no. Because David has been very. Uh, uh, affected emotionally more than anything else about this topic. Uh, he spent uh, years uh, trying to perfect the skill of doing serial bypass surgery and, uh, and becoming excellent in clipping aneurysm operator and IBM. And, and now those volumes are trickling. Uh, uh, yeah, you got too many people doing it. Can you imagine Vena Gallens when I, now my practice, I have, I, you know, there's one of the papers that was rejected. I call it damaged goods. You know, um, I used to get X amount of patients. Uh, they were virgin, that they were, you know, uh, disease was not no touched by anybody. Country. Right. Now I get, uh, everybody thinks they can do it. So I get at least 60% of my practice, they, they have undergone a treatment somewhere previous. And the treatment is... What a freaking baby. Think about yeah. that. And, and I tell you, and the, and the treatment is not being good. That's why they came to me. So how do you deal with that? You know, it's, uh, I, you want to, the last part of my career would be Don Quixote Berenstein, you know, <laughs> going against the dead meal. I'm going to go, it's a big problem, but I think it's a regulatory. And I, I hate to tell you, but unless, unless our leadership in the country uh, changes where there is honesty instead of lies, this thing will continue. To, but let's say, let's. I want to finish in a positive, uh, in a positive. But, but, but you, you you mentioned education and uh, and the way we educate people, and we have uh, uh, thousands of students that are we're responsible for uh, imparting some knowledge to over the se next several weeks, um, and and we have found that after the pandemic, this is a great way of uh, communicating, Incredible. a great way of educating others. Um, and staying in touch, and these and the students are uh, uh, learning for for free uh, all these weeks, six weeks of of, of teaching. So, um, what is what should be the the formula uh, to improve our education system in medical training, in medical education? Because right now it's not working. That's why we need to go to free for service, and people are fighting for other reasons, and and all this uh, mess that we're dealing with. Very good question. I mean, you know, we need to do in the training, in the education, and get involved in the economics of medicine as a topic, as a subject, the ethics of medicine as a subject, the duties. You know, we should not just, just show how the cell works. We should, we, we should have within the education of the, at the medical school level, not at the, but there should be part, I, I didn't, I didn't learn any of that. Did you learn in school anything about the economics, about the ethics? Did you learn about the nutrition? You know, the, I mean, there's tremendous deficiencies in the curriculum 
of, of uh, medical education. And I think for you young people that are listening to this, uh, it should come from you requesting, demanding that you learn about these topics, that you learn about what is, what is the impact of my actions. If I do X or Y, what are the ramifications to society? Of course, to patients, but to society. And I think if we start on getting in to the ethics of it, uh, the culture of medicine, uh, maybe something can be improved. It's going to take time. It's going to take, again, leadership is the key to all this. Okay. And, uh, okay, the, David, you want to say something before? No, I mean, uh, for this audience, I, I know we, we have thousands of, kids, thousands of students. I'm not sure how, how many are on the Insta feed now, but, um, you know, I, I, when Alex and I first met in 1998, uh, the first thing he did is screamed at me for walking into his angio suite with my thyroid shield not closed. That was my introduction, Alex Bernstein. And, uh, you know, Alex and I have been uh, through a lot together. Um, some po mo vast majority positive, some negative. I think, uh, I think we... That's human I, relations, isn't it? I think uh, I, there are a few people I've learned more from uh, and that I, uh, the, the relationship that I had with you and the experience I had from you, what you did for my uh, career, who you introduced me to, the Jackson Hole meeting, um, Tolkien, uh, those two particular things uh, ramified in me for, were in very deep ways, as well as the experience I had working with you in the two hospitals where we worked together. And I think it's, it's resulted in my relationship with Rafa, uh, which is one of the things I treasure most in my life. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think that I've definitely changed especially since I came to Lenox uh, over the past, you know, seven years um, and, and having gone through uh, what, what have we all have um, and seeing the world change, I think this kind of like implosion of uh, vascular neurosurgery has given me a lot of, you know, I've thought a lot about, uh, you know, your, your words and what, what, what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. In some ways, had I not trained and not did what I did, I, I don't know what I'd be doing. I'd be lost. Or I'd be doing you know, spine surgery at Roosevelt Hospital or something. But you know, long story short, I, I think that you are truly a uh, pioneer. Um, after I trained and, and the more I worked, I began to realize not only what you, the hard work that you were up, but how difficult this must have been before you had the catheters and the engineering and the designs that we readily use now without even thinking about it, to, gone, to have gone through that and to have experience the probably the terror and the and the, the patience you need uh you know I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for that as well as the creativity and the compassion you showed your patients and you know um it's it's just an extraordinary thing what you've done you know i, I think that uh we all owe you you know a, a tremendous amount of uh, respect and credit for really being one of the fathers of interventional and, uh, you know, I, I do some, in some, in some ways regret that this didn't last longer than it did together. And I uh, you know, fully respect that we probably uh, both would have ended up in places uh, different than we probably would have thought in, in 2004, or 2005. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think your impact in, at Sinai and with your team is incredible. And I, 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 you're, you're, what you've done with Rafa and the way he thinks and the way he behaves has had a huge impact going forward so you live on through him and so I just want to thank you in this form in particular because of how much of an impact this had on my life and my career so thank you David it's it's been a pleasure knowing you enjoy because you are a really good friend Rafa uh, I wanted Rafa to say as my partner but you stole it from me no no stop <laughs> now here uh, listen we're, we are very lucky Jason I have nice meeting you uh, uh, Yavel, uh, hopefully you are in a good place with great people. Uh, Definitely, but, yeah. <laughs> but we are we are very fortunate that uh, we have this opportunity. And uh, for all of you young people that are listening to this, don't let anybody talk you out of it. Medicine is a fantastic career. It is a fantastic world. You have a little bit of science. You have a lot of humanity. Uh, you have a little bit of, of every aspect of human behavior. Uh, it is the most fascinating, I believe, profession in the world. Uh, so whoever tells you no, 
don't listen. It's a fantastic, fantastic voyage. And uh, Dr. Bernstein, uh, thank you for this time. Um, and obviously, as you know, I'm 100% uh, in gratitude uh, and, and, and permanent debt to you because your wisdom, your experience, your teaching, your voice, they're always in my head. Always. Every day, all day long. So thank you. Okay. Hopefully you don't get nightmares too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned to, 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 to deal with it. Not pay attention to them. <laughs> you, are, we, you have about 10 minutes for questions from Insta. Do you want to go over yes. some of those? Yes, sure. Do you have them there? Yeah. Uh, someone asked you, asked uh, how, um, uh, if there's a future medical student, uh, how is biotechnology uh, affected? The, how has that impacted? Uh, I guess this, the technology is on your profession. I think you could comment maybe on the what, what how biotechnology has been so you know in, impactful of interventional. Why don't you comment on that? Where we are, where we were at the beginning to where we are now. Oh God, you know, uh, I would say that uh, if you define biotechnology as to uh, starting with the uh, metals, uh, we have metals that have elastic properties. We have metals that can be changed, that can be shaped, can be compressed. We have imaging. The imaging of today, it is incredible. Uh, by the time you get to be an endovascular neurosurgeon, you're gonna be living in 4D. Uh, today we have, not only we can image the vascular system in two, you know, from one, this way and that way, we can also rotate and have 3D. But now we're getting a thing called four dimension which is 3D in time. Uh, you know, there's only one limit, imagination. One question is, how did you handle failure along the way and keep going? You can cry. It's okay to cry. Uh, when you lose a patient, when something happens, uh, many people try to or tend to keep it inside. And I think it's important when something happens, uh, not infrequently with David, with Rafa, we used to sit down and talk about it. Maybe not in the moment it happens because it hurts a lot, uh, but we talked about it because that's very important. And if something is done wrong, the most important is to recognize the mistake and learn from the mistake. Someone asked, hey, can you talk about your work at the Vascular Birthmark Institute? Oh, that's traumatic. No, there was a, <laughs> the, 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 no, there was, there was there's a, a, a very, very, uh, important thing because it was the same philosophy that Rafa mentioned, which was a multidisciplinary group. That means that you had people from plastic surgery, you have people from ENT surgery, uh, you have people from dermatology, uh, we have a, 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 a hematologist, of course, uh, interventional uh, radiologist. Uh, so we had, uh, it was the way to put together all these different specialties that deal uh, with this birthmark, but neither of them can survive by themselves. Uh, so that was one of the things. We do the same in cerebrovascular. You have the example uh, right here in uh, Lenox Hill, uh, where, as Jason said, you know, uh, I'm a vascular neurosurgeon, and I have my in, uh, vascular neurologist and my interventional neuroradiologist. So that was specifically for skin lesions, uh, but it was a multidisciplinary group. Very successful, actually. Uh, what's the best advice you've ever received? <laughs> Don't talk so much. <laughs> Nick Hopkins says, you were born with two ears and one mouth. <laughs> For a reason. And then uh, there's a couple of questions about Latina being Latino. Um, and uh, this came up uh, with one of Rafa's talks also. And, how you, you know, the difficulties are coming from, obviously you came from Mexico, Rafa came from Puerto Rico, you know, what, what advice you'd have for uh, Latino and Hispanic students in the United States? Yeah, you know, just uh, keep your accent, it's okay. There's nothing wrong to have an accent, uh, but uh, you're as good, if not better than anybody else. Uh, you have the opportunity, take the opportunity, run with the ball. And, and make the best out of it and show everybody that if you get the opportunity. Listen, it was so hard when I came into this country. And, you know, first of all, I thought I knew a little bit. But the first thing, that I thought that two and two was four. I did not know that two and three was five. 
<laughs> and my first attending tells me the two and three six. So, oh man, what am I gonna, okay. And then they talk to you, E-R, O-R, you know, all this, you know, code, what does E-R, O-R? So the guy was close and, and you're supposed to know, right? I mean, they talk to you about, you know, uh, so be modest and, 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 and just, I'm serious. The opportunities are here. This country has a lot of prejudice, a lot of prejudice. But you know something? You can, you can fight it. You can go and you can then push it, which unfortunately the whole world is, is prejudiced. Uh, so we have to deal with it and confront it, but in a positive way, in a positive way, not in a conflicting way. Question is, uh, what, what would you guys like to see in cerebrovascular treatment in the future? I think you mentioned that, Alex, actually. Yeah. We'll see tissue transplants. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see everything. We'll chemotherapy, radiation therapy, endovascular radiation. Uh, talking about that, you mentioned uh, transvenous embolization of AVM surgery. Uh, are you doing that as a first choice, or are you trying to tr uh, embolize transarterially, and if you can't, then go transvenous? Well, you know, listen, uh, Rafa, it's very different when you're on the way out than when you're in the mix of things. I'm doing a fair amount of transvenous, but there's one thing that uh, I'm not as, uh, as uh, what would you say, cowboy uh, about it. I mean, all I need is at the end of my career, you know, Dr. B, the last five patients he did, they all died. That's not the way I want to finish my career. But I am convinced that the transvenous route is the way to, is, is, is the time that we're going to conquest AVMs. Uh, I have had uh, Rene Chapeau here several times. I've done cases. I've done, in Germany, I've done about 25 cases. And we've had one complication and we've cured the others. So I think that is definitely a, a, a major, major, major uh, thing forward. Uh, what we're doing now is shrink it as much we can transarterially where you're comfortable and the small residual that you have uh, that we can finish transarterially come transvenous. But I am still quite pro-surgery. You know, when you work with a guy like David, uh, Jason, I don't know you yet, uh, but when you, guy, you work with somebody like David, I mean, David, uh, you remember when you did the first AVM, when we did the first AVM, and look how you do AVMs today. So I am very, and I have, I work with Sadi Gatan and, and Dr. Bederson. He's actually a pretty good surgeon. So I am very still uh, pro-surgery. Vision is, is operable. Um, I won't go transvenous because I don't think that at this stage of my life, a career, I want to have a complication there. But I'm telling you, uh, Yafel, Rafa, it's, it's, it's really good. Select your cases well. Don't be shy uh, to invite somebody to be with you to do the first ones. Uh, it is actually not so difficult. Navigation in the venous system is, is, is new to us. Uh, there's some tricks that you learn. Uh, in Europe, they have all these things. They have the komamichi, uh, they have a balloons, uh, they have uh, uh, guide wires, they have the Sony catheter, uh, they have the uh, detachable tip of five centimeters with the Apollo. So they have many, they have squid, a low viscosity system that is definitely better for transvenous. Uh, but it's gonna come. I think it's a, it's a great future. I think you have one more minute on Instagram before it times out. Um, any final, Roth, anybody, you, Roth, is your questions or thoughts to, for Alex? No, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, uh, again, uh, we are fortunate to have Dr. Bernstein talk to us about his uh, career and experience. And uh, uh, every word that you say carries a lot of weight because of the experience and knowledge and uh, the, the, the time you've spent studying the craft. And, and improving yourself. And I know that you do it today uh, on a day-to-day basis. So thank you for your dedication. Thank you for inviting me, Zvin. You know, this is what I call family, guys. Uh, and we've been in a family for many years and I miss you a lot. And thank you for inviting me. Okay. You're Thanks welcome. for being here. Sorry I was late. <laughs> okay, no. And when this COVID thing- I'll watch you on YouTube later tonight. Okay. <laughs> we need Take to care. look at here and drinks. I, I'll yeah. see you tonight at Netflix, okay? Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.